Okay, the first question, it says a hummingbird averages 60 wing beats per second. Out at this rate, how many times would the hummingbird an hour long flight? So I start with the one piece of information they gave. They gave me 60 beats per second. I wanna know how many beats per hour. So I need to, the beats is correct. I just need to turn seconds into hours. I know there are 60 seconds in one minute and that my seconds cancel. And then I also know that there are 60 minutes in one hour and my minutes are canceled now and I now have the correct units. So I just need to do the arithmetic and I'll have my answer. So what I have here is 60 times 60 times 60, which is 60 cubed, which is six cubed plus 10 cubed. This is the way I quickly did it. Six cubed is 216, 10 cubed, it's not plus 10, it's times 10 cubed. Sorry, this should be a times sign. Yeah, just erase that and rewrite it. That's six cubed times 10 cubed. So I get 216 times one plus three zeros, which is 216 with three zeros. And now I need to turn it into scientific notation. So I'm gonna move the decimal point. One, two, three, four, five. The answer is 2.16 times 10 to the fifth. And chat. Okay. And our next problem says a marathon is 26.2 mile race. Kendra average speed during the marathon is 7.2 miles per hour. Which function represents the distance in miles Kendra has left to run in a marathon T hours after the race begins? So the distance she has remaining is equal to the starting distance, which is gonna be 26.2, minus how far she's ran. And how far she's ran is her rate times the time. Her rate is 7.2 and we are using T to represent time. Are there any questions on the answers to the warmups right now? Okay, the person who just came in, please make sure you stay on mute because we are recording. So I want you guys to come up with the answers to these first five things and see if you can do the last one while I'm working. Anybody else who just popped in presence? So the first parts of that question should be fairly straightforward. Um, and I want to know what the sum of the first odd integer is. Well, the sum of one number is itself. So that's just going to be one. The sum of the first two odd integers is one plus three, which is four. The sum of the first three is going to be 1 plus 3 plus 5, which is going to be 4 plus 5, which is 9. Then 1 plus 3 plus 5 plus 7 is going to be the 9 plus the 7, which is 16. So in chat, does anybody see a pattern to my answers if I keep on adding another odd integer? What do you notice about those four answers that I wrote down on the right-hand side?
So they alternate odd and even. That's one thing. I can see that. Anything else? What's special about the numbers 1, 4, 9, 16? Here, I'm going to do another one. The first five integers is going to give me a 25. The first six is going to give me 36. The first seven is going to give me 49. The first eight is going to give me 64. Do you guys see the pattern now? All of those numbers that I wrote down are something special. They're some things. Does anybody see them? What do we call multiplying a number by itself? Wrong direction there for the last one that was just typed in. We are not taking roots of numbers. Okay, one is one squared. Four is two squared. Notice when I wanted the first one odd integer, if I square one, I get its sum. If I want the sum of the first two odd integers, if I square two, I get the sum. Let's try the third one. Three squared equals four, I mean nine. Three squared is nine. So if I want the sum of the first three odd integers, I just square the three and I get nine, okay? So what is the sum of the first 50 odd integers? Well, if I follow that same pattern, if I want the sum of the first 50 odd integers without doing adding, I just want 50 squared, which is five squared times 10 squared, which is 25 plus two zeros. So the answer is 2,500. Okay. Um, we're gonna be, I'm gonna probably at least once a week, I'm gonna do one of these, think about it. So you guys can, I'm trying to get you guys to start recognizing patterns, sequences and stuff like that. These. Um, really neat things that are happening with these perfect squares. I'm going to show you a way that you can also, without seeing the one, the four, the nine, and knowing that they're perfect squares because their numbers are perfect squares, I'm going to show you a different representation of this problem. Okay? So the first odd integer is the number one, and I'm going to represent it with just a single dot. Okay? The second odd integer is the number three, and I'm gonna represent it with three dots. The next odd integer is the number five. I'm gonna give it five dots. And I'm gonna do the one for the number seven, and I'm gonna give it seven dots. So this is a way that I could represent the first odd integer is black, then the blue, then the green, then the olive. Now let's look what happens here. So one is just a one by one square. So I'm gonna change my pin really quick. This one right here is a one by one square. Now, if I were to combine all of these things together in the same picture, I would get one dot there, I would get my three dots. Notice what I have here. I have a two by two square when I add the first two numbers together. I have a three by three square when I add the first three odd integers together. And when I add the fourth odd integer to it, I end up with a four by four square. This is another way that you can see that the answer is just going to be a perfect square. Every single time I add an odd integer to it, I'm going to get another square with this type of visual representation. Okay, that's it for the warm up. Um, the burning questions, the ones I saw in chat, 
I'm going to do 19. Ooh, let me change my pen. Uh, I'm going to do 19 out of that, out of 1920 and 21. I'm going to do 22. I'm going to do 23. I am going to talk about number three out of that first group that I saw in there. Are they any other burning questions? Any questions out of seven through 12 or 13 through 18 before I start doing the burning questions? Okay, so the first one I wanna talk about is the number three. Number three says write two equations in standard form that are equivalent to the given equation. And my given equation is 6x plus y equals 1. And equations are equivalent to each other if they are off by a constant multiple. So as long as I multiply everything in the equation by the same number, I'm going to get an equivalent equation. So I'm going to write the two things I'm going to do. Um, for the first one, I'm going to arbitrarily pick multiplying everything by two. The second one, I'm going to multiply everything by three, and I'll get two equivalent equations. Um, so the first one is two times six X is 12 X. Two times Y is two Y. Two times one is two. For the second one, three times six X is 18 X. 3 times y is 3y, and 3 times 1 is 3. The reason why I'm only going to do one out of 19, 20, and 21 is because once I show you this again, the other two are very, very simple. If you go back to the notes from Tuesday, I actually did an example just like this to make sure it was in your notes. So first thing I'm gonna do is in general, I'm gonna just plot the point first. So the point is at eight, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and one, two, three. I think that is good. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw the horizontal line that goes through that point. And I'm going to draw a vertical line that goes through that point. So what I want to do is I want to write the equations for those two lines. Well, the equation for a horizontal line is an equation that begins with y equals whatever number the line goes through. Well, in this case, it's going through y equals one, two, three. If I wanna write the equation for a vertical line. Vertical line goes through x. So I need to write x equals whatever number it's going through, and it's going through the number eight. So anytime I give you a point, and I want you to write the equations of the horizontal and vertical lines that go through that point. All you have to do is write X equals whatever the X coordinate is and Y equals whatever the Y coordinate is. So if I were to say, I want the equations of the horizontal and vertical lines that go through negative two comma three, my vertical line goes through X equals negative two and my horizontal line goes through Y equals three. X coordinate, Y coordinate. X equals negative two, Y equals three. Okay, 22. So I, um, your cell phone plan charges you two cents to send a text message and seven cents to receive a text message. You plan to spend no more than $5 a month on messaging, okay? No more than is less than or equal to, okay? No more than is less than or equal to. That's um, from Algebra 1. 
So, oh, uh, I'm going to go back. I just saw a question on problem number three. I just picked the two and three. I can pick any number. I could have actually here, start out with 6x plus y equals 1. I could have picked anything. As long as I do the same multiplication operator to both sides, I am going to get an equivalent linear equation. I could have been just totally demented and multiplied both sides by three quarters and got, in this case, I would have had 18 fourths, which is 9 halves x plus 3 quarters y equals 3 quarters. I just pick whatever I want to to come up with equivalent equations on that one. Did that answer the question for that last question that was typed into chat? Okay, so back to number 22. So your cell phone charges you two cents for a text message to send. I'm going to use the letter S for send. Seven cents to receive. I'm going to use the letter R for receive. You plan on spending no more than $5 in text messaging. Okay. Um, no more than is less than or equal to. And that's going to, I want my total amount to be less than or equal to $5. Well, it cost me two cents for every one I send plus seven cents for every one I receive. Okay. That is the answer to A. It says B, graph the equation from part A. Explain what the intercepts mean in this situation. Well, I told you that if you have an equation where that's like in standard form, and this is basically in standard form, an easy way to do it is the cover-up method. Put a zero in for the y-coordinate to figure out what the x is, and then put a zero in for the other one to find the y-coordinate. So I want to find my cent intercept. The way I'm going to find the intercept for sin is I'm going to cover up the 0.7R. I'm just going to cover it up, and then I'm going to do what it says. I want to solve for S. So to solve for S, I divide both sides by 0.2. So if you take 5 and divide it by 0.2, I mean 0 0.02, I get 250. So my x-intercept is going to be 250. 50, 100, 50, 200, and then 50. So I got that by doing $5 divided by 0 0.02, and that is equal to my s. Now I want to do the same thing. I want to solve for the r. To solve for the R, I'm going to cover up the S1 and then just look at the 0.7R is less than or equal to $5. And I'm going to get 0.07R is less than or equal to 5. That means I'm going to divide both sides by 0.07. And yes, I'm using a calculator. Um, 5 divided by 0 0.07 gives me 71.42. I'm going to put approximately 71.4. Um, they're going up by 25s on this one, so I'm going to go 25, 50, 75, 100. I need to put a dot at 71.4 to be about here. And then what I can do is I can connect those two dots and I did not have an equal sign. I had a less than or equal sign. Less than or equal to means below. So what in this case, any answer that is below that green line that I drew, any combination that's in this region 
is a valid con uh, valid combination that's going to keep me from spending more than five dollars a month. Okay. So our intercepts. If I send 250 messages and don't receive any, I'm going to spend five dollars. If I send zero messages and receive 71 messages, I'm going to spend less than five dollars. Okay, that's what those two intercept means. It says that lists three other possible combinations. So all I'm going to do to pick possible com combinations is I need to put three dots in that place that I put the red crosshairs. I'm going to put a dot here so I can send 100 and receive 25. That's a possible combination. I can put a dot right here, which is sending 100 and receiving 50. Um, I'm gonna put a dot right here. I can send 100 and receive zero. There are an infinite, well, actually because you can't send half a text message, any, any um, discrete number, any integer that falls in that region is gonna give me an answer. So you actually could figure out whether you know, the finite ones, but it's a very, very large finite number of ones that you can use. So did that help with question number 22? Do I need to explain it anymore? Okay, I'm gonna continue with 23. Um, I did not have time to copy the um, text, but I'm gonna read it. You are making 24 pounds of your own potting soil mix, which consists of some peat moss and sand. So I'm gonna say P is equal to peat moss. S is equal to sand. That's what I'm gonna use for my variables here. You buy the peat moss in bags that weigh two pounds. The last time I made 24 pounds of potting soil. So I made 24 pounds of soil from peat moss and I used nine bags of peat moss and four bags of sand. Last time I made 24 pounds of potting soil, I used nine bags of peat moss plus four bags of sand. Okay, so I'm gonna erase that. That's not quite what I want. Oops. Why are you, there we go. It says, so here, here's, here's some information I know. I had 24, um, so sand. I want to figure out something about sand. So I made soil. It took 24 pounds. Okay. Well, I used nine bags of peat moss that weighed two pounds per bag. Well, that's 24 minus nine, uh, not nine, 18. 24 minus 18 is six. So to make 24 pounds of sand, I ended up using six pounds, I mean, 20, uh, 24 pounds of soil. I use six pounds of sand and I use the 18 pounds of peat moss. Okay, use this information to find the number of pounds in a bag, of course, sand. Okay, well, I used six pounds of sand and I used, and it said that I used four bags. Well, that is, tells me that each pound of sand, I mean, each bag of sand is one and a half pounds. Six divided by four is three halves, which is one and a half pounds. 
says, write an equation in the standard form that models the possible combination of bags of moss and sand that I can use. Um, so the relationship that I can use, let me duplicate this slide and go to it. And I have the information that I had up at the top. I'm keeping the other slide still going to have all of this stuff on it. Okay, so let me go back here. So part B says write an equation in standard form that models the possible combination of bags of peat moss and coarse sand that I can use. So um, this is my relationship. It's I. Uh, let's go back a slide. I used nine bags. So the, the key things I hear, I have nine bags and six um, and four bags. So let me put a nine bags and four bags. Any relationship that has um, peat moss with a nine, let's say four with an S, it's going to give me the relationship of my peat moss. So anything that has this relationship, I can use to make a valid thing here. And that is going to equal 24 pounds. So what I can do is I can multiply this, these by anything I want to, and it'll tell me how many pounds of soil I'm going to make. I'm going to, I'm going to multiply by two separate things. The first one is going to be one ninth. So I can use one pound of peat moss plus four ninths, uh, one, one bag of peat moss plus four ninths a bag of sand is going to equal 24 ninths of a pound of soil. Okay, I can multiply the whole thing by three. So that would give me 27 bags of peat moss plus 12 bags of sand is going to give me 72 bags, uh, not bags in this case, this is gonna be 72 pounds of soil. So once you come up with the generic equations, so this is the number of bags for both of these, all you have to do is multiply your equation by any number. So I did two of them. Again, you can pick anything you wanted to for the third one, for example, 10, which would give me 90 plus 40 equals 240 um, pounds of soil. So that's it for the homework. What we have today is um, a new section, and this is solving linear systems. Um, and the first way we're going to learn how to solve linear systems is by graphing. So what does it mean to solve something? Okay, to solve something, I want to find answers that make something true and I'm going to put a word always true if I am solving one equation my solutions or where um, the things that give me the answers that are going to make it always true are going to be my x-intercepts Anywhere that the graph of the equation crosses the x-axis is the solution to a single equation. Okay? But a system of equations is two or more equations with the same variables. Okay, 
and a solution to a system. So to solve a system, I want to know where the equations cross each other. on a graph. So if I have a graph and I have one equation that happens to give me this line, I have another equation that happens to give me this line, my solution to that particular system of equations would be whatever that point is. And I can create systems of equations where they're all linear. I can create systems of equations where one is linear and the other one is some other type of equation, or I can create systems of equations where none of them are linear. And we're going to get some of those later on this year. For right now, we're going to talk about solving linear systems. And I have shown you the first way of how to solve a linear system is I can graph my linear systems. And the solution will be where the graphs cross each other. Other ways we're going to see how to solve linear systems are we're going to do a method that's called substitution. Okay. Another way we can do linear systems is a method that I call elimination. And we're going to do elimination by either adding or subtracting one equation from another, or we're going to multiply slash divide one or more equations by a number and then go back and add and subtract. We're going to have lessons in that. Um, these are the methods that are used, that are taught in Algebra 1 that we're reviewing now, so we have, we're good with them before we can um, do nonlinear solutions. And then there's going to be another way. And I'm going to call it linear algebra. Okay. I'm going to teach something called Kramer's rule. That will be, um, say, another way that is not shown in any of the textbooks. But it is a way that if you have a system of linear equations, you can come up with the answer, I think, quicker than a lot of these other ways. And when I was in high school, we actually learned some of this linear algebra that is no longer in the high school curriculum. But I want to show you another method so that if you get stuck on solving something, it will give you a way to do it. Now, you can always solve your systems by graphing and figuring out where they cross. I will tell you right now that, heck, if you want to, you can type all these things into Desmos, let Desmos graph them, and it'll tell you where they cross. But I will tell you on a test, you are physically going to have to graph equations um, on a piece of graph paper. So yeah, you can cheat and look on Desmos, you know, type it into Desmos and kind of cheat. But once you get back into the classroom, for those coming back, I'm going to be able to tell immediately if you can't graph your equations. So today, we're actually going to solve systems by graphing. OK, um, I told you that something is a solution if it makes everything true. So something is a solution that means it's going to always be true. If I give you a coordinate and a system of equations, you need to be able to tell me whether that point is where they cross. You can tell that if that point is where they cross by sticking the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate into both equations to see if they're both true. Right now, I am doing homework five, even problems. Those are not assigned to you. You're going to be doing some odds. So if you have your homework five worksheet out, you can follow along with the even ones that I'm going to do. So number two, they give me the point negative two, one. I want to put negative 2, 1 into both of my equations to see if I get two, two, two true statements. So I'm going to put it into the first equation, and I get 5 times negative 2 minus 2 times 1, and I want to know if that is equal to negative 12. 
So I get five times negative two is negative 10. Minus two, is that equal to negative 12? And negative 12, yes, is in fact equal to negative 12. So the first equation checked. I can't just assume that the second equation is gonna check also, I have to actually put the numbers in. We put negative two plus three times one and see if that is equal to one. So negative two plus three is one and one is in fact equal to one. So my answer to this question is yes. But to get that answer, I physically have to do that work. Okay. Number four, I'm going to put a negative four in for X. So three times negative four minus put a negative six in for Y and see if that is equal to six. Three times negative four is negative 12. A negative of a negative six is a positive six. And is that equal to six? Well, is negative six equal to six? No. I can stop right there. I do not have to put it into the second equation. Once you find one that does not work, you can immediately say no. But here's something I wanna warn you about. If I would have done the second equation first, a negative of a negative four plus two times negative six and check to see if that is eight. So I have four minus 12, is that eight? No, I get negative eight equals eight. Again, that one's a no. There are gonna be, so the possibilities I can have is they're both yeses, which means a yes. They're both no's, which means a no. One of them no, and one of them yes, which also means a no. Okay, I just didn't have, have an example of the one yes, one no. So first group of problems, you're telling me if things are solutions. The second part is use the graph to solve the system, check your solution. Well, to use the graph to solve the system, I said the solution if it's graphed are where the graphs cross. So I'm gonna say it is at negative one comma four. And once you come up with that point, you do the last, um, you do problems like these, put that point into both equations and see if you get true sentences. So five times negative one minus four, is that equal to negative nine? Negative five minus four, negative nine is in fact equal to neg negative nine. So that one checks. Now I'll tell you, if you're reading it off the graph and I don't check, um, you need to go back and reread the graph. Let's do the second equation. Y is four plus two times negative one. Is that two? I have four minus two, which is two. Two does in fact equal two. So there's my work that I check. So read the point off the graph and put that point back into both equations. Next one says solve by graphing, check your solution. Okay, they are all in standard form. So I'm gonna just show you the graphing. So for this one, first thing I'm gonna do is cover up the Y. If I cover up the Y, it looks like two X equals negative four. If I solve this for X, I get X equals negative two. So I put a dot at negative two. Then I'm gonna cover up the X's and I see Y equals negative four. I'm gonna put a dot at negative four. This first equation has, this for its line. Okay, if I don't have a straight edge I can put on the TV to do it, but you guys use a straight edge. Second equation. I put, I cover up the Y and I get X equals negative eight. If I cover up the X, I get negative Y equals negative eight. So that means Y equals a positive eight. And if I were to play connect the dots on this one, this is what I would get. Figure out where they cross. 
Write down that coordinate, negative three comma four. I'm not gonna do the work, but you need to put that negative three comma four into both of those to check your work. For problem number 16, gonna do the graphs the same way. If I cover up the Y on the top equation, I get two X equals negative six. So X is equal to negative three, plot that point. I cover up the X's, I get two Y equals negative six. So Y is equal to negative three, plot that point. Connect the dots. Gives me my first equation. My second equation, cover up the y, that gives me negative 5x equals 15, so x is equal to negative 3. I cover up the x's, I get y equals 15, and this one's going to be a very steep line. And right off the bat, I know what my solution is because when I was doing my graphing portion, I found out that negative three comma zero, I already drew where they crossed, that point where they crossed. And again, if you wanna check your solution, put the negative three in for X in both equations, put the zero in for Y in both equations, see if you get true sentences. For the story problems, I'm gonna help you set up the story problems for your homework. Hanging flower baskets, you will be making hanging flower baskets. The plants you have picked out are annuals, are blooming ones and non-blooming. So I'm gonna use the letter B and I'm gonna use the letter N. The blooming annuals cost 320. The non-blooming ones cost 150. And I bought a total of 24 plants for 49.60. So my number of blooming ones plus the number of non-blooming ones is 24. Those are the two equations that you are going to need to use to answer the rest of the, the questions. So I have done this part of homework problem 22 for you. Writing a system of linear equations that you can use to find out how many of each plant you bought, okay? For this one, use Desmos to get your answer. So you're gonna type these two separate equations into Desmos. If you're gonna type it into Desmos, um, do 3.2x plus 1.5y equals the 49 and then do x plus y equals 24. Because the Desmos isn't gonna recognize the b in the n, let it do the x and y. And you'll be able to use Desmos, get the graph, and tell me where they cross. The other one I'm gonna set up for you. It says, in a game, 12 of the baseball team's 27 outs were fly balls. 25% of the outs made by infielders and 100% of the outs made by infielders and 100% by the outfielders were fly balls. Writing system that I can find the number of outs made by infielders and outfielders. Well, the number of bats from the outs by the infielders plus the number of bats out, outs by the outfielders has to equal the total number of outs, which was 27. Okay. Um, the next one, I hit piece of information, 25% of the infielders plus 100% of the outfielders has to equal the total of the fly balls. And there were 12 fly ball outs. I don't need to keep the one in front of the O for the outfielders. So those are your two equations. Okay, and then you can answer the rest of the questions that are on 23 using um, Desmos and then do the interpretation portion. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop the recording and open stuff up to ch uh, voice chat for actual
Any other questions? 